All right, welcome everyone to this panel discussion titled A Radical Network of Change. My name is Lynn Zebeda and I'll be your moderator for this panel today. I am uh, the co-founder of Dr. Monk, a studio that works on interventions to catapult us into a more just and green and compassionate future. So I'm excited about the, this topic of the day. Uh, I'm also a big fan of questions, big questions and inspiring thinkers and doers of which we have three on this panel today. And we're going to speak about collective action. So taking action together with a common goal, in this case, responding to the climate crisis. Uh, we know that this climate crisis is incredibly big and complex and we feel anxious, but we need to know that we're not alone in solving it. We're with many of us. So how can we take action together? How do we unite and how do we find the best version of our human selves in all of this? And how do we then actually create change, radical change? Because as activist and scholar Angela Davis once said, radical simply means grasping things by the roots, which is exactly what we need to do in this crisis. So I feel like a kid in a candy store today on this panel with the speakers we have. I will introduce them one by one as they start their stories. We have Matea de Jung, Selchuk Balamir, and Zora Musa. And uh, important for you guys watching is that we will have space for a couple of questions after the three presentations. So drop your questions at questions at impact.nl. And for anyone who's already in the Zoom, you can also ask your questions via video so that we can see you. Uh, so just let the Zoom host know if you do want to ask a question like that. All right, let's get this show on the road. I'm going to uh, introduce our first speaker, uh, Matea de Jung. Uh, the lovely Matea de Jung, I've known her for a couple of years. She has incredible creative power and as a social innovator, she has started loads of projects and initiatives. Her latest is Warming Up, which is uh, mobilizing the cultural sector in the Netherlands to engage people with climate change. Um, and she's also the director of Tolhuis Town, the best cultural hotspots in Amsterdam, I can tell you. Um, and what I'm excited about in Matea's story is that we get a little peek inside the brain of a real impact strategist. She knows many strategies to get things moving um, and she'll share a bit uh, of her knowledge with us. So Matea, the digital floor is all yours. Thank you, Lynn. <laughs> it's an honor to be part of this panel and I'm really happy also when I read about the um, the subject of this year's Impact Festival, Living and Connecting on the Damaged Earth. Um, well, two years ago, uh, the climate crisis really hit in. It hit in when I read a letter to Ed Naples. Oh, wait, I have my clicking thing on my mobile device. Let's see where it is. Yeah. Um, I organized the Artistic Climate Summit. It was part of the Cultural Capital Year in uh, Leeuwarden. Actually, Lynn was there as well as one of our moderators. Um, and we drafted a letter by artists that were part of this project. And one week later, I read it out loud to Ed Nijpels. Um, he is one of the, he's a prominent Dutch politician and an architect of the Dutch climate policy. Um, it was in a dull room with uh, only gay-haired people in a meeting about the climate crisis. Actually, people were only talking about money and windmills. And at the end of the meeting, I came on stage and I read the letter and it said, um, well, the next few years are the most important in our history. Right now, the effects of climate change are happening faster, stranger, harder and more devastating than scientists predicted. The expectations are surreal, yet they're real. We're heading for an uninhabitable earth. If we continue to live the way we live, if we continue to do what po uh, politics as we do politics, if we continue to organize ourselves as we organize ourselves, if we continue to make art the way we make art. So we as artists, we as the cultural sector need to become part of the solution too. And you at Naples, you can consider it as the missing climate table, that of communication, reflection, and imagination. And only then, when I read it out loud, I thought, holy shit, is this really true? Uh, of course, I read all these news articles, but it's, it all seems so far away and also a bit like just another problem to solve. And um, 
only when I read it out loud, I felt the magnitude and also the irreversibility of the climate crisis. So, um, I don't know, like, I think a lot of you also did. I read all those books, I went to all those debates, saw all the movies, um, and all my, and also my frustration grew. I mourned and everywhere I came, I saw people discussing the climate issue. Um, and they were, it, it felt a bit like an elite thing. Like they were all men <laughs> with ties and coats. And why were we not, not involved? Why, why were we not part of this, uh, this whole discussion? The climate issue concerns all of us, the politicians. Um, so uh, this was the start of Warming Up, an initiative to connect media, arts, and the climate crisis. Our assumption is that arts and climate um, can touch people in the heart, it can bring people together. We need music, images, stories, because um, I think arts and culture are, more, are often much more effective than reports, uh, percentages, and finances. Uh, because we need courage. We need to step out of our roles. And uh, if, you, if you have courage, it's something you need to feel. Um, so then again, our aim was impact, real impact. But where do we start? And what is our theory of change? And what can we add? Um, um, should we use a bottom-up approach or and have many, as many people involved as possible or should we work top-down and try to influence uh, decision makers um, and how do we measure our success so uh, we figured that well most of the people I knew uh, they thought about the climate but they shied away when, when I really started to talk about it they felt like they were Klimaatgekkies, you say in Dutch, or um, it's something you don't want to talk about. You want to, you you just don't want to think about it. Um, so we started this uh, warming up initiative, and we tried to invite everybody we knew in the cultural sector, like work with us, make music, start stories, uh, make theater plays, uh, films, um, to try to connect people to this big issue that will affect all of us, or that is already affecting all of us. Um, and uh, well, over the past months, we worked with lots of artists, media makers, advertisers to present all these stories and productions. I will present a, a couple of them to you. Um, and I think our main aim was that we wanted people um, not to turn away uh, hearing the word climate or ecological crisis or um, but start thinking about it and discussing about it and also feel that they are part of this um, part of the discussion too um, so uh, we invested a lot of time uh, to involve partners and cultural partners media partners but also local governments national co governments um, and uh, it was challenging in many ways. <laughs> and I think we succeeded in one way and we failed in another way. Funding proved difficult, uh, but we managed. Convincing arts organizations proved sometimes difficult. Um, should we really reconsider our flying policy, they said to us? And we thought, yeah, <laughs> you should. Uh, but I think, yeah, we managed in the end to have about 100 organizations um, they were happy and interested to join our collective campaign and use 2020 year to, um, to have much more people, many more people involved in this, in this issue. And when we were kind of ready to go, <laughs> the climate crisis hit in. Wait, I have another, I forget about my slideshow. Oh yeah, this was our letter, the climate uh, summit of reflection and imagination um let's see yeah this is our logo which we're, we're really happy about <laughs> um what's our impact strategy i just said it um well the, the corona crisis hit in it was very frustrating for us because how can we decide as a society which course to take how can we live together when we can't be together or how it can we become a radical network of change when it is so difficult to connect uh, and to meet and to really truly have a conversation where we can doubt, change our views, opinions, ideas. Uh, we continued because we felt the climate can't wait, but it was difficult. 
Uh, and in the meantime, we also had to shift our strategy a bit. So um, first, let's explain a bit what we did. Um, yeah, here's our slideshow. Slide uh, we worked on a climate letter, uh, signed over 24,000 mainly women, uh, just in a couple of days. Lots of um, artists, uh, actors, actresses. Uh, and we received a lot of media attention. And what we were ex especially happy about in the left corner, you see BNR's Vraag Aandacht voor Klimaatcrisis. Well, this was in the Telegraaf, the Dutch newspaper that has never used the word climate crisis <laughs> before. So we're, we were happy with the impact. But also, by I think what we managed to do is give people the idea that they're not alone. You know, that this eco anxiety or the stress that you sometimes feel is shared by all those people you see on telly. Um, in June, we Mateja, started this, you, have, you have around two minutes left so that you know. Oh, really? OK, then I'll, then I'll, mm -hmm. uh, then mm -hmm. I'll go faster. So this was a, uh, an outdoor exhibition by Jaap Schieren, um, a web drama series, Heat. Um, we organized the Het Grote Straatberaad in many cities, climate as citizen assemblies, uh, warming up festival in many uh, venues in the Netherlands and on Dutch telly a climate quiz uh, reaching like 1.36 million viewers which we were really happy about because it proved that people don't shy away anymore for the climate, uh, the word climate. Um, we had uh, lots of press attention uh, but still um, it was not as not how we hoped it to be. Um, 2020 was the was to be the climate year, but it became the Corona year. So we also developed new approaches. And in the summer, we um, different articles appeared about the citizen assembly. So uh, we connected with um, the, the the people who wrote those articles. And every Wednesday morning, we sat together to see if we can develop a lobby strategy to make this make a a proper citizen assembly, um, a reality in the Netherlands about the climate policy. Um, this was an article that we published in a Dutch newspaper, and uh, we spoke with many Dutch politicians behind the scenes, uh, and we organized a talk show uh, with members of parliament. This was uh, during the warming up festival. And two weeks ago, a motion initi initiated by the Christian Democrats was adopted by more than 80% of the Dutch par Parliament to start a research on the benefits of a citizen assembly on the climate policy. So we were really happy about it because I think we, it all kind of uh, um, worked together, with, also with Extinction Rebellion that um, really lobbied for uh, a citizen assembly. So it's we, we all have to work together behind the scenes to to make the impact that we that we that we want and i think um because i've only probably like 30 seconds left <laughs> yep <laughs> uh, <laughs> this is what this is i think my appeal that we all that this time is a challenging time and we need to step out of our roles and be courageous and do more that than than what we used to do we can't continue to make art the way we make art we have to do more than that and be willing to do so and connect with people outside our cultural sector uh, with activists, politicians, media makers to um, to make actual change. Because if we stay in our own bubble, um, we won't do much and um, and we and we need to do much. <laughs> so mm. I think this is it. Yeah. Be courageous. Thank you so much. Be courageous. I think that's an important. Yeah message indeed and I, I know that there's so much more to say and i just want to take 30 30 more seconds to ask you um as an impact strategist what is your kind of favorite secret trick from the impact book that you that we can also maybe apply in our work no, uh, yeah i think it's important to know what is your theory of change like what is your assumption mm -hmm. and if you if you're clear about what you uh, what your presumption is on on change making, then you can focus all you focus everything on that. Because otherwise, um, if you're not clear about it, you will you will try to aim so many different things, and um, 
uh, yeah, just be clear about what is your, your theory of change and then work towards it. Yeah. And I think like connecting all those different actors in all those different fields is like the key to change. Mm, yeah, I think we'll hear more about that uh, in the rest of the program. And you will join us again uh, for questions. If you do have any questions for Matea, please drop them at uh, questions at impact.nl, as you know, or ask them via Zoom. Thanks so much, Matea, for now. We're going to go into the next presentation. Um, our next speaker is Selchuk Balamir. And I'm so happy to have met this wonderful human through this festival, Selchuk is a designer, a researcher, an organizer. He has a long history of climate activism, of civil disobedience, and, and he's helped launch sev several initiatives that you will um, hear about. Uh, he's also doing a PhD in which he's looking at a more post-capitalist world, which I would also love to listen to for hours. But for now, he's going to take us through his own journey of acti activism and radical change. Selchuk, there you go. Hello, everybody, and thank you for this festival, and especially this panel. I'm really honored and delighted to, to meet you all remotely, but hey. Um, so I'm a designer by training, um, a researcher by uh, profession, and an activist by inclination. And I work on these three intersecting themes, post-capitalism, commoning, and climate justice. And while they all inform and inspire each other, I will be focusing on the last one, climate justice. So for most of the last decade, I've been indeed an organizer and a participant and a witness in lots of disobedient actions against uh, climate breakdown. I've been developing campaigns, growing collectives, and designing creative and strategic interventions for climate justice. And really, this movement has taken me to the ends of the world. I stepped out of my comfort zone. I put my body on the way of the machines over land and sea. Here you see us blocking the coal port in Amsterdam Harbor, uh, disrupting open cast lignite mines in Rhineland, and even stopping cruise ships uh, in Venice with a flotilla of boats. And I found that disobedience is actually the greatest form of body art, of land art, of performance art. It is the most moving thing one can ever do. And it is not all the time serious and gloomy and tough. It's also full of joy and imagination. Like my favorite action ever was with the queer feminist block in Endegelende, where we threw a disco party on train tracks uh, that connect like a coal mine to a power plant. There was tactical kissing, there was vegan pizzas, uh, yoga under detention, and lots of glitter on police uniforms. It was lots of fun. So there is beauty and purpose in being a movement organizer, and it makes you really develop survival skills that are fit for this decade that, where we need to make so much change. And yet, I would be lying if I claim that we all figured it out, everything is working perfectly and we are on track to victory. No, you can't just sit back and relax while we take down the fossil industry because it's not exactly going according to plan. So there are a few uh, limits to our movement's tactics. First of all, our um, uh, demographic base is relatively small and still homogenous. We are uh, overwhelmingly white, young, and maybe middle class precarious. Uh, so we need to diversify our movements. Um, we mainly take symbolic disruptive actions at infrastructure sites, which is not very inclusive enough, both in terms of abilities, but also it alienates workers in those sites. And um, our demands are still very sectorial, uh, like specific to climate and oppositional. We call for keeping it underground, in the ground, which is not exactly intersectional as a demand. So my overall question is, is it possible to experiment with new forms of organizing uh, to address any of these obstacles? And I will give you two examples I've been working on. 
The first one is Climate Games that we launched five years ago together with the Laboratory of Insurrectionary Imagination. Uh, we call it the largest disobedient action adventure game where it's like a transmedia event where affinity groups design their own playful disruptive actions. Our slogan was, we are not fighting for nature, we are nature defending itself. Because mimicking ecosystems, we can self-organize spontaneous cooperation and collective action in defense of life. And here's how it works. You come together with your friends, you pick your targets and your tactics yourself, you carry out your action and publish the results. And the best actions are awarded by poets. Some call this peer-to-peer -peer disobedience. Others labeled it a creepy, dangerous, irresponsible, lone wolf, climate direct action recruitment group. I have to say both had a part of the story, right? So Climate Games culminated in its 20, uh, COP21 edition, coinciding with the UN Climate Summit in Paris. Remember that this was in the middle of a state of emergency, which was declared following the terror attacks a month earlier. While no mass protests were allowed, there were more than 200 actions that were carried out by more than 100 teams. Because Climate Games offered emergent strategy, you could easily adapt your plans with your group of friends. Here are a few examples that I really love. The Insurrectionary Innovation Badge went to tools for action for inflatable barricades that disrupted the streets, confused the police and the activists. Fossil free culture campaigners across Europe converged at the Louvre and won the prize for best crowd choreography. There were hundreds of billboards that were taken over by Brandalism Collective and they won the big splash cup. The team Zoological Ensemble for Nature Liberation invaded Volkswagen car dealers dressed as animals, fruits, and even legumes. They were given the award for ultimate unexpectedness. And finally, Give a Shit replaced the toilet rolls at the conference center with the ones which had the uh, IPCC report, climate report, printed on them. It got the I pissed myself cup. And in the following years, six uh, local independent climate game editions that we've heard of were organized across Europe. And we think that with this method, you win some, you lose some. Uh, on one hand, it's DIY, uh, decentralized, replicable, but the actions themselves become quite low thresholds. It's very creative, innovative, and adapts to the situation but it's not always the most strategic things to do. And you have this swarming, unpredictable, ungovernable qualities, but the gathering becomes and remains ephemeral. So how to overcome all these? Here's my second example, which I co-developed um, last year with uh, Coderod and many partner organizations. It's called Shell Must Fall, paying tribute to Roads Must Fall, which had sparked a whole decolonial uh, movement in South Africa. So once a year, corporations have the legal duty to organize an annual general assembly meeting where uh, directors and shareholders uh, meet to discuss important decisions like distributing dividends or green lighting investments. So basically that's where the future of a company gets decided. This is why last year at this meeting, AGM of uh, Royal Dutch Shell, we proclaimed that it was a historic day. We declared that it would be their very last meeting ever held as we announced our intentions to stop it from happening ever again. Because really in the midst of a climate emergency, the last thing you need is shareholders of an oil giant still being in charge. We were adapting the latest social movement innovations from Hong Kong and Catalonia. We were planning meticulously for the most highly anticipated mass action of the year. And for a fleeting moment, everything seemed to come together. Then everything fell apart because COVID happened and we found ourselves in yet another state of exception where we couldn't meet the thousands of people that was supposed to converge uh, the conference center. And while the Felt AGM didn't minutes. actually...
Perfect. Two minutes left for you as well. Yes. And I have two slides left. It's perfect. Um, so we can't even take credit for the cancellation. It was just held online, just like our session right now. Of course, we did know that dismantling Shell was not going to happen overnight with just one day of action. In fact, if we are serious about a controlled phase out of Shell and other fossil fuel companies, we need a few things. We need to disseminate our vision, build a broad consensus and ultimately gain power. Uh, we need to radically but responsibly alter the ownership, control and purpose of such companies. And we, do, we need to do those as part of a rapid, comprehensive, just transition program for energy democracy. So in the coming months, we will be publishing a report and a podcast series called A Future Beyond Shell. Finally, I'd like to end with a series of questions because I don't have much answers. Uh, these questions are currently guiding my research at uh, Basis for Aktuelle Kunst, uh, back in Utrecht. Um, so how to grow like resilient organizations that can withstand whatever history may throw on us, a pandemic, a, a crisis, whatever. How to mobilize a truly mass movement with demands that are intersectional by design, that it's not an afterthought. And how to win a climate tra transition, a corona recovery, and colonial reparations at the same time, because we don't have the luxury to leave an, uh, any of those to another decade. So, uh, Matea, Zora, and Lynn, I would love to hear from your uh, wisdom and visions, and I'm looking forward to hear insights from our audience as well. Thanks a lot. Thank you so much, Selchuk. I'm sitting here with a big smile looking at all your images. Um, I do want to ask you, were you ever scared? in any of these actions? Yes, absolutely. There are many moments mm. when I step out of the comfort zone or the night before the action, I say, what am I doing here, really? Like, mm -hmm. uh, especially yeah. as a migrant, I don't have the same rights as European citizens, I shouldn't be doing this. But then I re remember, this is really a small price to pay com compared yeah. to what is to come if do anything so in yeah. all you know relativity these are really minor uh, inconveniences to yeah me. yeah so you're courageous like uh, Matteo just told us to be thank you Selchuk for now uh, before we go into our um, conversation together I'd like to introduce our third and last speaker on this panel her name is Zora Musa and she's the executive director of Mama Cash which is the oldest international women's fund in the world. And Mama Cash provides support to grassroots uh, social justice group, groups led by women, girls, transgender, and intersex people. Uh, so she knows a thing or two about this uh, intersectional intersectionality word that Selchuk just ended with. Um, and I've experienced Dora, uh, her intellect is as sharp as a razor. Some of the things she said in our preparation still really ring in my ears. So I can't wait to hear what she has to say today, reflecting on today's topic from a more international, global perspective. Zora, welcome. Thanks so much. Hi, everyone. It's super weird to be doing this when you can't see um, anyone else. So I don't, I don't know is, if you but we hear you. <laughs> You're just staring into a camera and can't see anyone else. So hi everyone. We're, we're all with you. <laughs> um, maybe I can start a little bit with kind of a story about how I I started. So when I was younger, I thought um, revolutions and revolution was something that was about kind of cannons and wars and heroic men winning the day and things like this. And then I started to learn a little bit about how women got the right to vote in Canada. I grew up in Toronto. And I learned about this in school and I wrote my first essay on the history of feminism in Canada. And I learned about how groups of women got together and kind of just reflected on their situation and their status and what they were confronting. And they decided they were going to, to fight for the right to vote, to be recognized as, as people, as human beings, 
as legitimate human beings in the country. And they organized themselves and they doggedly pushed and persevered for decades, facing humiliations and retaliations, um, jails, punishments, all kinds of things, but never giving up until they won. And learning that really, really blew my mind, really boggled my mind. It, it changed everything once I realized that um, a bunch of people working together um, over time can change what feels like an impenetrable status quo, uh, an immutable force like gravity or something like this. And it was such a fundamental idea that women were equal to men, that everyone before hadn't recognized it or refused to recognize it. And these group of women over centuries just, just pushed to change that opinion. And n knowing that even now, when I think about that even now, that continues to be a source of inspiration and drive for me. And I think many people find the idea of evolution very grand, very scary. Um, but actually, the definition of revolution is, is much simpler. It's a very important change in the way people do things. And that's it. And revolutions rarely start <laughs> by someone going, hey, let's start a revolution. Uh, they can definitely start that way, but they don't have to start that way. And we look at what's been happening over the last few months in terms of the, the mobilization by the movement for black lives and the global uprisings that they sparked most recently, which is, you know, just another wave in their, their um, centuries worth of effort for that recognition. We see that it's not that someone got up in the morning and said, hey, today I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to start another revolution or I'm going to start the next stage of the revolution. It was much more organic um, than that. But I think what makes something happen, what the difference is, um, what, what makes the difference is that people decide to act. And it's people working together through what we call collective action. And I think Cedric also mentioned it. And, and Matea a little bit as well. It's groups of people getting together and working together and through, through what we would call collective action and building a movement. And social movements also themselves are sometimes hard to understand. We think of them as, you know, NGOs or things like this, but social movements are much, much more broad based than that. And they require many different kinds of actors within uh, the collection of people working on this for something to really make a difference. Um, and a social movement, by definition, is, is something very simple. It's an organized set of constituents, could be activists, could be people who call themselves other things, pursuing a common political agenda of change through collective action. So it's people who have a, who have a, a thing they want to change working together to achieve that change. And it, it's nothing more complicated than that. If we were doing this in person, if we were live and I could see you, I would be asking you whether you consider yourself an activist and kind of asking you to raise your hands to just see how, how many of us, or, or wiggle or show in some, some way, how many of us consider ourselves activists. And I would ask things like, have you ever signed a petition? Have you ever been on a march or a demonstration? Have you ever donated to an organization or a cause? Each of these types of activity make a difference and, and can be part of your activism. And it's, it's a kind of buildup of all those things that slowly makes a difference. Not all of us are going to take to the streets. Not all of us are going to participate in direct action. Um, it's not safe. We all face different risks. Um, we were just hearing about the importance of thinking about, you know, intersectionality and who is privileged enough to be able to put um, their body on the line or are able to confront the police, for example, if you have status in the Netherlands, if you're a citizen or you have the right to be here, you maybe have more leeway, you have more room to be confrontational with the police as compared to if you're waiting uh, to hear about your status in the country or if you are generally targeted by police anyway, you may not want to face another confrontation. Um, so we, we all have different kind of choices that we're able to make um, and different agency that we might want to exercise. But even within that, there are many 
possible routes that we can each take, many possible ways that we can get involved to do something. There was a really interesting study that was published just a, just a few years ago. Um, and it's, it looked at, um, over se it studied over 70 countries over four decades and looked at what made the difference for governments to take action on violence against women and girls. And it looked at a whole bunch of different variables. And it found that the single most important variable was that there was an autonomous feminist movement active in the country. That was the variable that determined whether the government of that country would take any action on violence against women. It was more important than how wealthy the government was, like what the GDP was of the country. It was more important than the persuasion of the government at the time, whether it was a left government or a right government, for example. It was more important than how many women were in parliament. We often think about that, right? Like what's the representation of women in, in government? But it was more important than that. It, um, for, for all of that, for, for each of those countries and over four decades of looking at um, different kinds of statistical data, they discovered that a feminist movement being present and autonomous, really having the ability to self-determine what its agenda was, was the single most important variable. And if we think about the revolutions that have happened, if we think about the right to vote, for example, women's suffrage, that happened about one lifetime ago in the Netherlands. Yeah, last year marked the centennial of women's suffrage. Women secured the right to vote 71 years after the first men, men in the country, men in this country secured it. And it took women almost a lifetime to achieve that. So it took about, thinking about a lifetime is about 80 years. It took about a lifetime for women to achieve it. And it happened about a lifetime ago. If Zora, think there's about two minutes left. Okay, if we think about the kind of official abolition of slavery, um, the year before last marked 155 years since it was abolished in the Arabians, and the Netherlands was one of the last countries to do so. That happened about two lifetimes ago, and it took about three lifetimes to achieve it. Same-sex marriage, that was achieved within many of our lifetimes, but it took more than three lifetimes to get there. Before that, it was a, a criminal offense. Uh, to have people uh, of the same sex having any kind of sexual activity between them. At each of those points, things, ideas um, were very fixed. There were strong ideas and the prevailing wisdoms suggested that women shouldn't have the right to vote, that it was normal to own other people, um, that there was a gender binary and only men and women should get married. And we were able to overturn those concepts. I would say Maybe just to wrap up, there, there are kind of three kinds of activism that I've been noticing lately. One is in self-defense. You're directly affected by something, and so you have to resist it. Another is out of a, some kind of moral imperative. So we were hearing in first, Matea's first presentation around climate, climate justice, or the climate crisis, also with Cedric. You know, we may, we may feel a moral drive to do something about it. And the third thing I would want us to notice is that it's the responsibility to act and the power to make a difference. And I would say for those of us in the Netherlands and thinking about the climate crisis, this is where we maybe want to get a bit more motivated. There are companies headquartered in this country that are having devastating impacts on people around the world. And we have the ability to ship them because we're located here and have influence over them here. And the people that are affected around the world don't have access don't, can't get to those companies, can't show up at their doorsteps, can't change the toilet paper rolls in their offices, but we can. So that can be a motivation for us about why to act. I think I would just end by saying it is entirely possible to change the status quo. It is entirely possible to be part of a, a revolution. You may not even realize that you're in it, but you can notice when you're choosing to act and when you're not choosing to act. And that decision can be made by everyone every single day. You can every morning get up and decide the world is not yet what we need it to be. It is entirely possible and necessary to change this. People are doing it every day and we can join them. Thanks. Thank you so much, Zora, for this uh 
different perspective on the on the same topic, I would like to invite all three of you in to reflect a bit on uh, where Zora left off. Uh, can I have all the panelists with me? Yes, thank you. Um, because after hi, after Zora's presentation, uh, I want to dive a little bit deeper into how do we actually practice that international solidarity? Because indeed, we know we all have a role to play. We also know that we're in the same climate storm, but we're not in the same boat, right? It's not a coincidence that on this side of the planet, we are able to brainstorm about changing uh, the narrative around climate, uh, etc. While in other places, it's indeed more self-defense. People's houses are flooded or they're trying to protect their ecosystems and they are even murdered in the process. Three times a week, there's an activist murdered as they are protecting their own uh, environment, right? So. Um, so the question here is like, how might we then be truly together in this? How do we really practice that international solidarity? Who has thoughts on this? <laughs> so well, I, can, I think you're uh, ready. To... <laughs> um. I think that was one of the driving forces behind um, organizing uh, Shell Must Fall. Exactly like Zora said, like we have an incredible responsibility being in the country where this multinational Royal Dutch Shell is officially legally uh, bound and present. Um, so our actions here, which we have uh, slightly more uh, space to, 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 uh, to take this obedient action, has implications on the front lines. Uh, so th this is all the framework of uh, climate justice is ultimately boils down to this, right? Like the ones that are most impacted uh, are the ones uh, that are leading it. And uh, yep. we are the ones take more responsibility to take uh, action. But also looking at ourselves and how we reproduce uh, certain dynamics that we want to overcome within our movements is also key in order so that to not replicate these uh, you know, toxic tendencies. Uh, as you said, you know, direct actions are not for everyone within our societies as well. We have incredible uh, differences in that. There's a great uh, slogan in, uh, in the French movements which goes, uh, pas de barricadière uh, sans cuisinier. No female, uh, no woman at the barricades without a uh, man in the uh, kitchen. Uh, the kitchen, oh, in, nice, in yeah. The same of the work, uh, and theorize others. So I really don't want to make, yeah, the, the front lines going to the mines is the only way to uh, take action. On the contrary, we are all supported by incredible invisible layer, uh, la labor of care um, that, that has to be recognized and has to be equitably shared among us. Yeah, yeah, good point. Zora, do you have any additional insights on also reflecting on what Celtic is now saying and how we can do this better because this is indeed about climate justice. Yeah, sure. I think um, it's a, a little bit about what I said and what Celtic's also saying in terms of kind of recognizing our possibilities to make a difference. There's, of course, a, a responsibility there, right? So just really recognizing that we, we caused the problem, right? So it's ours to clean up, but also we yeah. have the possibility to, to make the change. Um, we can influence. Uh, some of these power holders um, that are creating the crisis or fueling the crisis. And so why not use that lever when you have that possibility? Mm -hmm. And one thing I would really want to pay attention to in that is just thinking about risk and this idea that, it, you know, it's, it's risky to expose yourself or to take this step. It's deadly if we don't, right? So to really acknowledge that, that it's just a matter of time about when it's going to get difficult. So better to be active about it and take control now while we still can um, and take on the less, the lower risk that it is now to act yeah. compared to what we would be facing otherwise. And also the risk we would choose to take possibly in the Netherlands is still much lower than the risks facing other activists in other contexts that are out of necessity, out of self-defense having to act. So yeah. the least we can do is attempt to match, match their courage um, even even just a fraction. And I would yeah. say, so 
you know, I, I do work with Mama Cash and we exist for that, for that, for that way of, of channeling solidarity and um, sharing the risk and working together. Um, yeah, so exactly, because the more risk I take, or the more risk we take, the more you protect others in the exactly. process. Yeah. yeah. I would like to open up our conversation to, we have a couple of questions uh, from our viewers um, as we go along, because I feel this is a beautiful question that, as Nora, you just explained, you started with a story about how you became involved and what opened your eyes to, okay, change is actually possible. Uh, the question uh, we have here uh, from cur curator Lara is, um, can the others maybe also say something about a specific moment that really opened your eyes, like, wow, okay, I can make a change. Matea, do you want to start? Um, I don't know. There were several moments in my career, but also my personal life, when I figured, okay, we can make a change. And um, um, I used to work with movies that matter for a long time. So um, I figured that a lot of change was happening by um, making a space to connect, uh, to make people connect. Um, so policy changes were made uh, behind the scenes uh, before or after the debates that we organized in public. Um, but I don't know, like, uh, I think you, you also need to focus on sort, sort of small wins. It can sometimes kind of be so big and so humongous and like you can't um, change the world in general. But I also feel that that to me it is also key how we do this, how we do this coming 10 years, how, how, how do we work together in this decade in solidarity, in kind of love and mildness towards each other's strategies mm. and ideas. Uh, because to me, like one of the most important things um, to, to, uh, to work on climate change is community building. Uh, because first you need some kind of self-confidence and love towards yourself to feel that you can take part in society and can uh, speak up, uh, which is about our next step. So all these different layers are important in, um, in, in, uh, yeah, in, in, in this whole issue of climate, uh, climate change. And uh, to me, working from a cultural hub in, in Amsterdam, which is really interesting because it's one of the greenest uh, parts in central Amsterdam and uh, the old Shell office. <laughs> so um, yeah, I feel it's also my responsibility to use this space as uh, a hub to a more inclusive and fossil fuel future. Um, but but uh, being activist, being working on um, uh, community building at the same time is uh, they're both really important to me. And I feel yeah. that we also have to acknowledge that we all have different roles in this. Like one has a more activist stance on it, while another one, like it's warming up, we try to popularize the theme, um, which doesn't mean that I disapprove of active, more activist techniques, but that we all have a, play, a part to play. You, you yeah. know what I mean? Yeah. Like, yeah. Yeah. And I actually want to kind of jump in with an, an, another question that, that came from our audience that builds on this. Um, and, I, and it's directed to Selchuk. That's, that's why I want to ask it at this point as well. Because as Matea is now saying that uh, the climate movement is so diverse and we need to kind of build community. Everyone is trying to get their own piece in and um, how, how do we come together in that, right? And how, do, how are we mild towards each other? And, um, and it's funny that this question from Laura to Selchuk is actually about her, her feeling so strongly about a piece that other other parts of the climate movement are missing. So for her piece is about regeneration. Uh, and she's saying that, um, you know, in the climate movement, she feels that uh, a lot of us are skipping that whole I idea of regeneration, that we're focusing on sustainability, but that's not enough anymore. We really need to like, regenerate the earth and think of alternative ways on how do we relate to each other and to non-human, uh, parts of this web of life. Uh, so her question is like, how could then this climate movement bring that regeneration uh, into society? 
because some are just focused on, on technology, some are focused on whatever it is, but how can we really bring this important piece that she cares so much about? How can the climate movement bring that in? Thank you for this. Um, I think the key is like having our actions really um, already uh, present in the uh, in, in today the way things we want uh, them to be in the future so them to be prefigurative right and we need to indeed what does that word mean prefigurative so that we do things uh, today uh, the way they sh should be in the future Just okay that's, that's okay that's new that. word thank you uh, but at the same time, we need to have this uh, long-term vision, right? Like, I do take responsibility with, like, this decade, and yes, we do need to step way out of our comfort zone this decade and uh, achieve uh, uh, unprecedented things, but we also are aware that we are in this for the long run. It's uh, yeah. a long-haul uh, journey. It will take generations to regenerate the Earth. Um, yeah. to, to, so this is just uh, putting extra bit of work so that we get that uh, threshold, that uh, breaking point. I think we have the responsibility of this. I sometimes, uh, you know, provocatively say the, the, the resistance uh, to, to, to fascism in Europe, they weren't really concerned about um, uh, regenerative and sustainable activism. Maybe good, maybe bad, but like they had a duty to, to, to give it all in their times and theorize uh, what they were doing. But the following yeah, generations okay. have to, to take the flag and uh, continue with it as well. Yeah. Yeah, exactly. So what you're saying is we need to keep that long-term vision alive in which regeneration is, is extremely important, but we also have yeah. phasing in this and we have short-term responsibility to just bring down certain structures that are really blocking pro progress right now. And also yeah. just to add, like these are really deeply rooted systems, right? It goes yep. back to colonialism. It goes centuries so it's not like all the emissions we have uh, uh, caused the last uh, decade or so so we do take yeah. responsibility for this longer term as well and act at that critical juncture yeah yeah maybe building on that as as you're saying it's it is deeply rooted right indeed going back to colon colonialism and uh, the roots of capitalism in that and Zora um, what I remember so much in our conversations, uh, preparation conversation, is this: what you said about this is—it's not a coincidence, right? It's—it is by design that we find ourselves in this system. Uh, I don't know if you maybe can quickly enlighten us on that, so that we are aware that wait a minute, it didn't just happen, right? Mm -hmm. Yeah, I. I I don't know how much I can enlighten, but I can share my perspective on it, which is that um, it's this idea that I was talking about, about it being an um, immutable force, the idea that it's a fixed thing instead of an invented thing. So we are in yeah. the situation we're in because particular ideas were created and invented and progressed, not that it's unchangeable or by accident even it is entirely by intention and by design some people gain through this situation right people are benefiting there are certain people who staying in this situation in status quo is entirely in their interest they don't want it to change and they're actively working uh, to make sure we don't overturn it um, and so to just to recognize that there is a conflict here it's not an innocent situation that we're in um, that's not to say that we have to go around sort of hating on people or, you know, we still need to build dialogue and we need to convert people and we need to build common cause. And that's that's what movements are about, right? Like bring, bringing yeah. in more and more people into a common idea. And that's what a lot yes. of, you know, the examples we heard about are about is how do you win the narrative? How do you win the um, the debate, the public debate? But I do want to be clear that there there is a counter force that we're resisting. Yes, and there exactly. are architects behind the situation um, that we also have to address and yeah. recognize that, yeah. that conflict is real, that we, it, it, our passivity, you know, we are complicit. If we don't choose to fight it, we are complicit in the situation. Exactly. And we may be not, so, not realizing it because we think it's a natural situation because it's our normal. But there's nothing yeah. good about this. Just something's normal doesn't mean it's good. 
right? Just because yeah. it's every yeah. day. So we do actually have to kind of wake up to the fact that you know we're in the matrix or whatever. Exactly. And just, just yeah. be aware of how these things are constructed. Yeah. And then resist yeah. in a variety of ways. So yeah. as we were talking about, there are different roles to play. Some of us will take more activist approaches. Some the cultural element is really important. This idea of um, using art and beauty and creativity uh, to help us imagine different ways of being and knowing, you know, just the and yeah. reclaiming also things we've lost or that have been stolen from us or that we are deliberately denying of ourselves. Right? Yeah. It hasn't always so been this actively way. reclaiming what we. Uh, need to yeah what makes us human right because this is indeed about showing up uh, as humans and practicing that radical care as uh, as we've all been hearing these words that Matea used also just love uh, in action um, we've come actually to the end of our hour it's it's um, so sad <laughs> but it was very rich uh, if I just look at some of the highlights uh, that you guys have shared uh, because we've looked at this collective action issue from different sets of experience here um, and we've also concluded just now that it, it it's an imperative to stand up because this is not an innocent situation that we're in uh, so we need to be courageous as Matea said and be clear on that theory of change like how do you exactly think that you're changing something and then just going for it gathering the right uh, uh, parties around you um, Selchuk you also showed us what Zora just said that actually this journey can be full of joy and full of beauty if you stand up for what you know is right and if you're willing to take a risk, right? That would, which uh, also protects others in the process. Um, and Zora, you emphasize that even though sometimes things feel like they're made out of stone, everything can actually change in this society because we made it all up. Uh, so it begins with this decision to act, and that can have a major impact way beyond what you maybe think uh, your impact is. Um, so it was a beautiful conversation. Thank you guys so much. Thank you everyone uh, who was watching. Don't forget that love is the master plan here. We're never alone in this quest. Uh, and enjoy the rest of the festival. Thank you. Thank you. <laughs> mm -hmm. Mm -hmm.